almost every night to see if he's still alive or not, right? I found out during that, you know, every time I got to him, I heard the shelling and the bombing. The overwhelming part of this, that he was the one who was calming me down. I mean, every time I, I hear these things, I watch the news, I watch TV, of course, you know, we all like, became glued to, to just to see and uh, hear something, right? He was the common voice for me. He was calling me to check on me. It became actually the other way around. And I was wondering, how is that funny? And the guy has been under attack. And actually, his family's house has been, been partially demolished for the third time. Since the first war, the second war, and the third war, every time his, his house has been a target, actually, to be found because he happened to be in the area where, like, those government buildings. But I came to a conclusion. Why is this happening to the Gazans? Among all the unfairness and justice, Gazans proved to be able to handle that better than a lot of us. They were resilient for taking this bombing, this unfairness, the, the, the enclosure, the siege, we siege around them for the last 64 years. I'm not gonna say it years, actually. It's been 64 years, the, I mean, those people are in big present. So I'm not gonna take much longer. I would like to thank you for coming. We're gonna start our program tonight. And actually, we're gonna start tonight with uh, a recitation, Quran recitation, uh, by our brother, Mahmoud Mayen. Verily Allah defends those who are true. Verily Allah loves not the treacherous and great. Sanction is given unto those who fight because they have not wronged, and Allah is indeed able to give them victory. Those who have been driven from their homes unjustly only because they said, Our word is Allah. For had it not been for Allah's repelling some men by means of others, cloisters and churches and oratories and mosques, wherein the name of Allah is oft mentioned, would assuredly be have pulled down. Verily Allah helps those who helps him. Verily Allah is strong Almighty. Thank you very much, Brother Mahmoud. Um, before we start actually our program, uh, I would like to give some little points here uh, about the actions that have been taken the last few weeks during this war in Gaza. There has been over 50 Minnesota groups that they call for an immediate end to the Israeli first strike of civilians in Gaza. And actually, in, in our next clip, we'll have actually, these are the, the, the groups that have been doing this. Also, there has been some local protests, several local protests, uh, going around town in different locations, just to bring awareness to people and, and remind them with the, the, the whole horrible actions that have been taken against Gaza. Al Amal School has uh, called for a community prayer for Gaza. That was yesterday, actually. That happened at six o'clock. 
Friday? Friday. Thank you for the correction. And uh, finally, I would like to, to call on behalf of AMP, everyone, to do several actions that they've been calling for, which is like call your congressman, uh, ask your child to, to send Mr. Obama and, and the politicians. Although I doubt they will listen to all that, but we need to do something and we need to teach our kids not to be quiet. And uh, finally, I'll ask you all to participate in any way to, to support these organizations that they work on behalf of the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community because actually we have several groups that are non-Muslims and they've been really active and supporting for the cause of Palestine in general. Also, I have uh, some housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, I'm going to express that the opinions presented tonight don't represent or reflect the organizers' views. Uh, and everyone is solely responsible for their own opinion. Uh, as I said earlier, we have people sitting available. Uh, we will try to have question and, and answer uh, part at the end, if possible. And finally, turn off or put in your vibration, your cell phones. Uh, if, if you need to make any call, whatever, go outside and do it. And again, I will thank you guys all for coming here tonight. I forgot to say my name. I know most of you guys probably know my name. My name is Calvin Rabaikal, and I'm part of the Learn Muslim Palestine Minnesota chapter. We can start. Actually, right now, our opening ceremony with uh, a little video that I really thought actually could talk about what's going on in Palestine and show that Gaza teaches love. Today, my body was a tv massacre. Today, my body was a tv massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits. Today, my body was a tv massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits filled enough with statistics to counter measured response and I perfected my English and I learned my UN resolution but still he asked me Ms. Ziada, don't you think everything would be resolved if you would just stop teaching so much hatred to your children? Pause. I look inside of me for strength to be patient but patience is not at the tip of my tongue as the bombs drop over Gaza. Patience has just escaped me. Pause. We teach life, sir. Rafiq, remember to smile. Pause. We teach life, sir. We, Palestinians, teach life after they have occupied the last sky. We teach life after they have built their settlements and apartheid walls after the last sky. We teach life, sir.
definitely with each line. And I hope that I'm going to try today, actually, I promised myself that I'm not get emotional on this, but I'll tell you every time I see this injustice in Gaza, I just get emotional about it, so I do apologize. Uh, I was trying to actually put right some statistics about the casualties in Gaza. And the saddest part, like, on an hourly basis, numbers change. I was listening to a media outlet yesterday, and they said only 10 Palestinians have killed. So they are used to a lot more. They are used to the hundreds. And it was okay. But the unusual thing was that only 10 people got killed. It's a sad thing. I guess we're going to move on to the next. Uh, we have, uh, a, you know, an Aqsa Institute speech by uh, the, the Aqsa director, uh, our dear brother Fouad Tamim. He's going to be talking actually on a few minutes about Laksa. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think it's only about one minute if you're welcoming more. It's not a speech. I'll let the speeches uh, to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. I'd like to welcome you all here today on behalf of Aqsa Institute. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, the CAD Foundation and our distinguished speakers for all their hard work and also for their support for Gaza and Palestine. Uh, please uh, give generously. Our brothers and sisters in Gaza need us, need our help. And uh, God bless you and Jazakallah uh, khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can tell that he has not been trained by our Arab regimes. He would have gone and gone and gone. Uh, studies show that U.S. news is extremely Israeli-centric. I hope you're all aware of that. And the main rule, I just want to give you a little bit here of, of how is that? Because I mean, we've been accused of, of if you say these things, you are anti-Semitic. You are just accusing it. Uh, the main rule for CNN, Associated Press, Time, etc are located in Israel and are often staffed by Israelis. The son of the New York Times bureau chief is the Israeli in the Israeli army. He's, his name is actually Bundit Jeffrey Goldberg, served in the Israeli military. Walt Blitzer, you know, Blitzer, Blitzer, sorry, worked for the Israeli lobby and numerous other journalists in the region have personal family ties to the Israeli military. So, I wonder how they're going to be, I mean, like, you know, neutral in this, in this deal. We have actually a voice from Gaza. Uh, Jihad Adman, born and raised in refugee camp in Rafa, assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, and his parents, his parents, siblings, and 50 nephews, nieces, are living currently in Gaza. Uh, please welcome Jihad Amman. Assalamu alaikum I know I have only five minutes, so I'm not going to go through introductions, but I would like to thank everyone who uh, made time today to be here and uh, to make your voices heard and to have impact on what's going on in Gaza. Even though I cannot tell you exactly what I feel because I have so many emotions all mixed up together every day, uh, much worse than what the stock market might show on, on any graph. But um, I can only tell you how the people I know and love and um, grew up with, and I and met, met them personally last year on our visit, how they actually feel. Uh, the fear is indescribable. I was talking to my sister, she's my youngest sister, my younger sister, um, and her three children in their apartment building in Rafah while the bombing was taking place uh, last night. Rafah was bombed more than 20 times last night and it was as close as half a mile from their apartment building and it could have been worse. I was Skyping with them and 
every time a bomb hits, I hear the, the sound and also the whole apartment.
from Sisi, that he plays a big role now in just eight hours. So I don't know why that I understand what does it take and what does it mean for people to die for their dignity and for human rights when they need to live in their own land. So anyone there, as the movie said, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Nadia. Uh, next, we are, you know, we're gonna we have this distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Sabri uh, Samira. He's the president of American and Middle Eastern uh, Affairs Center. Uh, it's a think tank, and a long-time thinker, uh, researcher, political scholar, and community leader. Please give him a warm hand. I have 20 minutes. Okay. I'll handle these, this tough task. I welcome my brother Muhammad Jalal from Chicago. Uh, I just noticed, of course, Safa Zazur is our great uh, leader and great brother. And of course, I'm so happy to be with you for this great cause in solidarity with Gaza. But I try to use my time uh, in a very economic way. Back to the basics. The issue is about occupation, oppression, and aggression. What happened in Gaza was people trying their best to refuse that, to reject it, to resist it. Of course, the Israeli did not want that. People are not giving up their dignity, freedom, dreams for being fully liberated in their own independent, free, sovereign state. People want to live in peace, just, just like human beings. This is the whole issue. It is not about any other issue. It's not about what the Israelis or others might say about terrorism, people creating chaos in the region, and this and that of those foolish and stupid stories that nobody is buying. This is another highlight of this struggle between occupiers, oppressors, and people want to live just like human beings. The basic ideas or questions of my short speech would be why this stupid thing has happened. Why the Israelis, in their own creativeness and smartness and all of positive things they might describe themselves of, why they committed what they have committed? Are they crazy? Don't they understand that the world is watching? Etc. etc. And then what happened exactly was it was criminal war against human beings. And we'll elaborate. The results of that, what is the results for the Israelis and for the Palestinians and for the whole region? And then our role in the United States of America, what can we do? Only making prayers, voicing our frustration and anger, rallying, donating, etc., etc., and all these things are great things to do, or we have still other things to do, including the final thing I will mention, which is to be politically and publicly active in order to influence the decision-making process in this country. After what we see happening, everybody is crying over what's happening, and then our own government will give more military financial aid to the Iron Dome and to the Israeli military to kill more people. In short, what happened is Gaza has paid the price for many things. One of them and foremost, for defending the essence of the Palestinian issue, for resisting the occupation, for the mere existence of Gaza as a strong community and people rejecting this occupation. Israel does not want to see anybody resisting that because Israel wants to kick out all Palestinians from Palestine, to finish the Palestinian dream, to not let them hope
that they can go back. Gaza was a representation of a will, a strong belief that Palestinians and all people who are oppressed, they can still reject and resist and refuse occupation. Israel wanted to kill that dream and idea and that strong place that is giving the Israelis, the Israeli government hard time. Also, the Israelis wanted to take advantage of what's happening in the Middle East. Arab people, regimes are busy with ISIS, with Daesh, with the collapses after the Arab Springs, with the coups, with the killings, with the disasters in Syria, in Egypt, and any other, in many other places. Israel thought that it can take advantage of that weak point and attack the Palestinians and destroy them and get rid of them. Because again, their larger dream is to get rid of all Palestinians out of, out of Palestine and to control everything. So they thought that this is a weak point where they can take advantage of that. Gaza was a unifying element in bringing Arabs, Muslims, all human beings around the globe to reject the Israelis. So they want to kill this point in order to make people feel hopeless. No other thing to do. That was the only sign that people still are alive and can do something. So for this symbolic and the principles and other analytical points, Israel wanted to finish and to get rid with Gaza. But what was the Israeli strategic purposes. One of them is, as I said, take advantage of the weak points, Arabs and Gaza. The Palestinians are still divided. So they wanted also to push them not to unify. Israelis witness that Palestinians are getting together. By attacking Gaza, this kind of Palestinian evolving unifying effort might stop because all the disputes that will happen between the PLO people and Hamas people and Palestinians inside and outside and so on. So they wanted to break the unifying effort. Why? Because Israel always has always said that we do not have a legitimate, strong, unified partner to make peace with. Palestinians were getting together to force the new reality of Israel. Israel is under heavy pressure from all types of powers, including the U.S., that enough is enough. We need to find a solution to this lasting struggle in Palestine. Nobody is accepting this. People are sick and tired, including the American government, the Western powers, etc., etc. They might not voice this in the media, but in reality, the Israeli occupation, the only occupation on earth, is causing many problems, even to the national interests of America, of the West, and so on. People of the region, Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians, and others are hating the American policy, the Western policy. So they want to finish this, they want to end it. The only obstacle in front of that is the Israeli aggression, arrogance, rejection of any kind of a solution. The Palestinians, including Hamas, they move forward. They are accepting real things. They are accepting 1967 border solution, including Hamas, and they emphasize this point. By going into unity and unified government, Hamas is agreeing to any solution that might come out of this effort. Mahmoud Abbas going to the United Nations, declaring an independent state, stating that Palestine is 1967 land, etc., etc. Israel does not want to reach that point where even the Palestinians are accepting less than 20% of their historical land because the, the Israelis are so arrogant, so greedy, they want the whole land, historical Palestine, all for themselves. So they do not want to create this reality by having a unified Palestinian government where everybody, including the Arab regimes, who are under heavy pressure from their own people, that they are not doing anything about the Israeli occupation. So many powers in the region and around the globe, including the US, want to solve the Palestinian issue. Who is preventing that? The Israelis. The Israelis want to create realities where they say we are not to be blamed, it is the Palestinians. No people to deal with, no uh, real Palestinian leadership to agree with, etc., etc. One way of doing this is by destroying Gaza and the presence there. So, in short, in the larger picture, as we were saying, that these powers want to solve the issue, the Israelis do not want. The Israelis attacked for these purposes and for other tactical reasons. 
One, they want to test their own iron dome, their weapons. Unfortunately, this is a reality. These aggression forces, these aggressors want to test their weapons in human beings, in real, you know, uh, exercise of power. And also they want to test what the Palestinians have on the other side. Do they have any abilities to counter these kinds of attacks? They want to test what kind of reaction will happen from the Palestinians, the Arabs, the Muslims, around, and, and other countries around the world. So to them, it's like an experiment. They don't really care about killing and destroying because they don't consider the Palestinians in this, you know, from the beginning that they are human beings that deserve to be dignified and respected and given their rights. So they have their tactical reasons for them. They are taking advantage of the Egyptian situation and position, unfortunately. The Egyptian government is participating effectively in, you know, in curfewing and in and making the life of the Palestinians miserable in all accounts. And this takes us back to the Arab Spring. The Israelis and other dictators in the region do not want to see Arabs free or ruling themselves because they fear if they do so, those dictators will go away and Israel will face a new reality that the Arabs are strong, the countries in the Middle East are democratic and they can put big pressure on the Israeli to end its occupation and so on. So there is a kind of common interest among all these groups to kill any voice, including of people in Gaza, that might give us a hope, a sign to people that we can still reject, we can unify, we can reject dictatorship, dictatorship, occupation, etc., etc. For all these reasons, and many other reasons, this war took place. The Israelis actually were at major fault. Besides killing and destroying and committing all kinds of crimes, which is what happened, this is my second item, what happened is a criminal attack on Palestinians. It is human war crimes against Palestinians. There is no other description of that. And Israelis should be taken to all kinds of courts in order to be held accountable, etc., etc. On the other side, what happened? Palestinians stood there, stand, they were strong, they, re they resisted, powerful and unified enough to reject all kinds of attacks, we did not hear one Gazan people saying a bad word about resistance or about the situation they are in in terms of do they deserve it or not. All their blame first were on Arab and Muslim leaders and countries, second on the Israelis, third on the Western countries including the US. So again, in reality what happened, a war crime, against Palestinians, but the Palestinians were prepared enough to be resilient, to be strong, and to resist. This is a big thing now in the strategy and in, in, in the analysis, that the military might has failed. This is something important. Israel did not and is not able to destroy the Palestinians militarily. This takes us to the larger picture, which is the Israelis Long time ago, they were thinking of their extended Israel from Euphrates to the Nile. Milfarad, Ilanin. Then it became Jordan and Palestine. Then it became historical Palestine. Then they were willing, still, theoretically, to give up West Bank and, uh, and Gaza, which is like they are taking only 80%. Then they have this isolation wall in Jerusalem. These things, strategically, ideologically, it gives us hints that the Israelis are not really able to hold them to their larger dreams and ambitions of controlling and taking everything. The resistance of the Palestinians, the lasting presence and resistance of the Palestinians did not enable them to finish the Palestinian equation. So they have to come to the reality. They have to face the reality. Their last four or five wars they declared in Lebanon and over on, on Gaza did not get them anywhere. It's bringing all bad things to them. So the reality is the Israelis cannot solve with their mightiest military power, they cannot solve this issue. They have to go to the political route, which is they are rejecting because of their arrogance and greediness, etc. These things, and here we, I come to our role in understanding the whole situation, if we understand these realities, 
We understand that, that the Arabs in the region are doing all their best, they are sacrificing, which is something I have to highlight and we have to understand. Arabs in the region, the people are giving, sacrificing, they are, they are accepting to be killed in order to achieve their freedom, to achieve their democracy. They are no more listening or obeying dictators and following their footsteps. They want their dignity, freedom, democracy, etc. This is a big thing to be happy with, that people are going finally to the streets. They are demanding their rights. This, of course, will help all these people and will help, will help the Palestinians. This will bring also to an end the Israeli largest dreams that they, cannot, they can continue with their occupation and uh, killing in the region. This makes, makes it like a collective responsibility for us. We have to help all Arabs in these regions, in Syria, in Egypt, in all other places. Also, we have to do our best to help the Palestinians in their struggle against the Israeli occupation. With this broader vision that together, Arabs, Muslims, non-Muslims, all kinds of Americans, they can support this cause because this is a human cause. This is a just cause. What the Palestinians want, they want justice, they want democracy, they want freedom, they want to live like human beings. This is something we all share. What's happening is a big disaster. Being, uh, people are being killed for no reason, for only asking for their own rights. Finally, and I can tell that the moderator will start pressuring me, the Israelis are losing on many other grounds, including the Jewish vote, the Jewish voice. Many Jewish people in the States and around the globe are expressing their rejection of the Israeli occupation and the killing of innocent people. Also, they are missing on the demographic changes in the Western world. Many Muslim and Arab population are growing in numbers and effectiveness in Europe and in the States. And if if things evolve in a decade or so, these people will have a voice in the political system. So Israel only to depend on its might and its alliance with the West and its support by some lobbies, including IPAC here, will not help. Israel is not really forecasting what is coming. It's better to Israel to come to a grasp with reality and to listen to all the pressure that is being put on Israel to give the Palestinians their own freedom country, independence, and so on. We hope so, but this is not, this, this is not happening only by the mere, you know, lecturing or dialoguing with the Israelis. We have to do our part. And here I end with this. Our part here is to participate in all activities that will create help and support to the Palestinians in their struggle, including in the media, the legal aspects, the humanitarian, the donations, the rallies, and so on. Yet, one final aspect I emphasize on, which is the political power. We have large numbers of Muslims, Arabs, and others who believe in the Palestinian cause, in the Syrian cause, in the Egyptian cause, who can really change the American policy, which is fundamental and critical in supporting the Israeli occupation and aggression. We have the November election. We have to work in all the places where, where we are to be found with our numbers, to register to vote, to work on creating unified voters Blocks, not one block, different blocks. District level, state level, municipalities, federal levels, etc., etc. We have large numbers. We have 7 million Muslims, we have 3 million Christian Arabs, we have many other millions who support these causes. If we do it right, we can really affect these policies that the American government is taking in supporting Israel. This is our responsibility, and hopefully, we can work with your community in Minnesota, with AMP, with all other organizations, with MASS, and so on and so on, in order to create this coming, hopefully, and evolving uh, political power to see it and to realize it and to be proud of it at a later point. Thank you, and assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I truly really appreciate you're really, really good. I didn't have to do nothing, so I appreciate it. It's really your time. Uh, as Dr. Samir actually uh, shared with us our civic duties, we need to work on our civil work, civic work. I know it's an uphill battle. Uh, there's an old saying, I'm going to try to translate it. It's to light a candle better hundred times than curse the darkness. So we're going to have to start somewhere. 
we have to do something. Even if it's little, what we're doing today here, you guys coming today here, showing the solidarity, maybe with, with, the, with the size of the atrocities that's going in Gaza, it's not much, but it's, it's something. At least you're trying to do something. And so we're gonna have all those to, to try to fulfill our civic duties here. So I just wanna share something with you actually. And the American news reports repeatedly describe Israeli military attack attacks on, against the Palestinian population as retaliation. I will share actually, I'm not going to try to dispute it from any, any other angle than the numbers. When we look into the chronology of death in this conflict, the reality turns out to be quite different. I'm just going to give you one statistic on this, and that's actually, I mean, I, I brought the source, it's Beit Salem. Beit Salem is an Israeli center for human rights in the occupied territories. So this is an Israeli Jewish source. And it says here, uh, I visited their statistic page, and I would recommend that you guys, guys all go on it and, then, and check it out. It has very interesting sources. Uh, and that number was 1938. It's much higher now. So it's more than 1,938 people were killed in Gaza. But it says, according to them, 84 of, these, of this number are civilians. And that's in the current massacre in Gaza that started on July 8th. This is not including, what they did not include in this chart, that there were like 68 Israelis killed. According to the 68, 5%, which is like three, are civilians of Israelis. I'm not condoning any civilian killing. They are all equally, you know, innocents in normal senses. But when you look at the numbers, it's devastating. If, if Israel is retaliating for the killing of one Israeli, they kill ten times more. I mean, this is really an unequal equation. There's something wrong in the picture. There's definitely something wrong in this picture. And when the media comes and they say Israel has the right to defend itself and they are only retaliating, there's a lot of injustice and, un and unfairness and we should not just sit and, and, and sit still and not say anything about it. We really need to voice our, our opinion out. We need to talk about it. This is, there's so much unfairness and injustice. And that leads me to the second speaker, actually, that these guys, they're not quiet. They're not quiet at all, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm so proud of them. It's, it's our PDS guys. Uh, we have here, actually, uh, Phil Benson. He's the statewide co-director of Minnesota Break the Bond a campaign, which is the, the leading BDS uh, organization in our Minnesota. He's an attorney. He, he is uh, uh, a member of the National League Guild for Palestine. Please welcome Phil Benson. condensed it down to the finer points. I'm going to tell you what Minnesota Break the Bonds is. I'm going to tell you what Israel Bonds are. I'm going to tell you what our state's doing with Israel Bonds. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what you can do on September 9th. I'd like this whole crowd to show up for us on September 9th. And we will have that political power. And we will take action using that political power, which will directly lead to change. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to condense it down because i got five minutes. So let's, you can time me if you like. <clears throat> Minnesota Break the Bonds campaign is Minnesota's only statewide investment campaign formed after the 2005 Palestinian Civil Society call for BDS. The target of our campaign is the multi-million dollar purchase of Israel bonds by the State Board of Investment, the state agency that manages the investment of public employee retirement funds. Patterned after the South Africa anti-apartheid campaign, the BDS call is the most potent, nonviolent, morally and legally sound civil resistance strategy for ending the Israeli occupation and demanding Israel's compliance with international law, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
What are Israel bonds? In the same way that U.S. Treasury bonds add money to the U.S. General Treasury, Israel bonds are the government of Israel's third largest source of funding after tax revenues and foreign aid grants from the United States government. Sizable portions of the money Israel receives from the sale of Israel bonds for human rights and international law violations that cannot be paid for with U.S. foreign aid, including activities related to settlement expansion in the West Bank and the purchase and production of weapons that are unacceptable to the United States government. When the Minnesota SBI purchases Israel bonds, it is helping to pay for human rights and international law violations that even the U.S. government has refused to pay for. The SBI is governed by the four top state constitutional officers, meaning the governor, the state attorney general, the state auditor, and the Minnesota Secretary of State, all of whom meet together four times a year at the state capitol to discuss SBI business. In the last three years, we have attended nearly every SBI quarterly meeting, where we often take the microphone to speak directly to these four board members about Israel's continuing human rights abuses and our divestment demand. The SBI's investment in Israel bonds has thus provided us an extraordinary platform that we have used not only to educate the public, but officials in both the legislative and executive branches of state government, and more recently, even the judicial branch as well. That educational process has included holding hundreds of events throughout Minnesota to educate the public about Israel's long history of human rights abuses and complicity by the United States government. We have collected thousands of constituent postcards at these events and delivered them to the legislators. We've also collected postcards that we deliver to the SBI before every SBI meeting. Each of the thousands of delivered postcards demand Minnesota's divestment from Israel bonds. We have initiated Israel bond divestment resolutions at DFL and Republican precinct caucuses throughout the state, triggering debate and discussion. Many of these resolutions have made it onto the floor of Senate district and county conventions. Four years ago, the Minnesota DFL Progressive Caucus endorsed our divestment campaign, which grabbed the attention of party officials at the highest levels. In person, in postcards, in letters, on placards, and in demonstrations, and a soon-to-be parade float even, we have called upon the SBI to stop violating Minnesota and international law and the board's own investment rules by contributing, by, by contributing financially to Israel's human rights violations. Our actions don't stop there. Two and a half years ago, joined by 23 other individuals and organizations, including the village of Baleen, Palestine, we sued the SBI to bring even more public awareness of the SBI's financial complicity in Israel's human rights violations. Our divestment campaign has gained the attention of the highest levels of Minnesota state government, the highest levels of the Minnesota DFL, national attention to the BDS movement as a lead strategy in statewide divestment campaigns, and most, most importantly, the attention of the government of Israel. Gaining an international offender's attention in a statewide BDS campaign is a major accomplishment. Israel bonds lining up just after any challenge to its U.S. foreign aid or the potential loss of U.N. Security Council cover is an Achilles tendon. Accordingly, the government of Israel has directly responded to us by hiring Governor Dayton's personal attorney to monitor our, our activities. Recently, that same attorney was retained by the state auditor, SBI member Rebecca Otto, in a campaign dispute. Go figure that. The government of Israel has also begun to advertise Israel bonds as a means of standing up to BDS and showing support for the way Israel conducts its business of oppression, thus confirming the link between Israel bonds and Israel's human rights abuses. During our lawsuit, if anyone in the world Googled Israel bonds, we popped up on the search results page. If you do it now, you can see the enormous Google placement campaign <clears throat> that has been waged by the government of Israel to push us back to page four. Page four is a respectable showing, given that our budget is substantially less than the enormous amount now being spent by the government of Israel on legal fees and advertising to prop up Israel bonds, probably about one million. 
Thus, our return on investment is far superior. We are getting closer every day to achieving our BDS goal. We now need the community to stand publicly with us as one huge voice. We have political power if, if we stand as one and if we exercise it. On September 9th, join us in mass at the state capitol to tell Governor Dayton to his face that his policies are murdering Palestinian children. Take the microphone and tell Rebecca Otto, Lori Swanson, and Mark Ritchie to their face that they need to muster the political courage with our united support to enforce the SBI's own human rights rules that prohibit the SBI from investing in Israel bonds. We will be the first state to divest from Israel bonds and the impact will be enormous. More than ever, that possibility is now and is very real. So let's finish the job together. Join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. I know. Uh, actually, I would like to just give two reminders here. There is uh, two hashtags that I recommend everyone who, who tweets to, to try to follow them and, and tweet on them. Hashtag Gaza uh, under attack. And, and also hashtag save Gaza children. So I, I encourage everyone to tweet as much as you can on those because actually now with the new era, social media counts. And also for things that can count and for, for Phil to, to touch on the base of those you know, politicians in Minnesota, a new statistic came out. Uh, and those are just for the Muslims, there are a lot of non-Muslims that we need to reach out, but there's like 30,000 registered Muslim votes in the state of Minnesota alone. Uh, for on national level, maybe this is not much, but on the local level, that's a lot. And I'll tell you, it has to be utilized somehow. So we need to find a way of utilizing all these votes to, to, to for Gaza, to start with, and for, for other issues, but you know, when it comes to human rights. Because I'm listening to these politicians, they all go for the Israeli libraries. It's like uh, they've been asked to do that, and actually they have to get the blessing of, of the lobbyists, the Israeli lobbyists, and they go and they show their support for, for Israel, right to self-defense. And, and when it comes to us, it's like no massacres. Yesterday, uh, someone confronted Mr. Dayton about his support. Of, of, actually, I, I was there, I witnessed that. And they, they asked him on, on his support for Israel, Conditional and asked him, What about those civilians who are getting killed? His answer was, I had no answer for you. And when he was pressured again on this, and they asked him what his stance against, uh, against the Gaza you know, attack, he's like, You're taking me off guard, and I can't answer that. I, did, I, I was not planning on this. <laughs> Am I right? That's word to word what he said. And I was so disappointed to hear that from Governor Dayton. Because at least you need to show that you have mercy over these little kids. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of the stats, children. It's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, we have over like 40%, 30%, 35 to 40% of these latest things. They're children. Forget about the civilians, 84%. Just half of that are children. Uh, they, they have actually a video for one of the Israeli armed soldiers. He was tweeting that he was so proud that he killed that day 13 Gazans' children. He was so proud and he said, I'm ready for round two. That's the mentality we're dealing with and it shows you the inhumane side of, of this Israeli reputation. And the world is supporting it because of many things. I, mean, I know you guys all know it. So but we need to do something about it. Somewhat, how, some way we need to start building the momentum. BDS, I'm so proud of you guys. I'm really so proud of them. I give them another round. They actually, these guys are awesome. <laughs> Our next guest speaker, and I know you guys didn't come for me, so you can't for these guys because I can't wait. I mean, I usually go from year to year for these 
conferences to attend these speakers because they always enlighten us with new things and new issues. Uh, brothers, or distinguished speaker, Mr. Safal Zarzur. And uh, he will share with us tonight a word of support for the Gazans to know that they are not alone. Uh, Mr. Zarzur is an educator, he's an attorney, and he's a community activist. For the last few years, he served as the General Counsel and Chief Operations Officer of Zakat Foundation. Prior to this, he served as the Secretary, Secretary General of the Islamic Society of North America, known as ISNA, and if you guys know, this is one of the largest organizations in, in America, actually. So, give it, give it up for Mr. Zarzur. So Dr. Sumaira lives in Chicago, I think like maybe a couple of miles away from me, and I have to come to Minnesota to see him. I've not, I've not seen him in a long time. Peace be with everyone. Thank you for being here. You know, it is said that for evil to prevail, all it takes for good people to do nothing. And today we heard from people on many fronts trying to do something, to not go before God on the day of judgment. And when he asked them, what did he do for these people that were being massacred in Gaza? They would have an answer. That God, I was only one person, but I did. I signed a petition for BTS. I went out to the rally. I did pay little money that helped one family or one child to sustain themselves under bombardment. I, whatever it is, I did. And that's really the only thing that we have. And as a care foundation, we come from that perspective. That we don't try to ask how big is the problem. We don't try to ask ourselves whether what we are doing is making a huge difference or is going to change things over in, a, in any massive way. What we always worry about, what we always talk about, what we always do is whatever we are able to do to, within our power to uh, push back injustice, to help people who are standing up. You heard about the situation in Gaza. And I would like to share with you a little bit more statistics perhaps and I hope that uh, I don't have control of the screen, so I hope that the slide will, will move as I go. Uh, so, as you see with the slides, we put here only less than 48 hours ago that it was over 1,800 people. It's closer to 2,000 today. And it's important to understand that over one third of them are children, some at the age of a few days old. Close to one third of them are women. And when we say that, that doesn't mean the other one third are combatants or people that, that, that carry weapons. Rather, of that third, probably less than 10% are people who are targeted for military activities. The rest are civilians. In some cases, as we saw in Gaza, for example, young people were executed, were huddled into bathrooms and executed at gunpoint in the bathroom. We Look at this situation and we have about 2,000 people, close to 2,000 people, over 1 million civilians that were attacked. There's a purpose for that. And that brings to, to, to the front the importance of what every one of us is doing. If you look back when the whole Palestinian catastrophe happened, you had purposefully a terror campaign conducted that causes people to flee their homes in fear. Palestinians have learned from 1948 and 1967 to never again do that. So, so what you will see is that they would rather be bombed in their homes, they would rather be killed than to flee, than to just clear the land as what the occupier wants. And so it's essential for us to help these people as they stand their ground and fight for their land, which is the most basic human right that a human can have is to, to be entitled to be safe in the place where they have been born, where they live, where they have not bothered anybody, they just do not want their land to be stolen from them. 
And so over 10,000 people have been injured and 375,000 and the number is growing of, of people are uh, uh, in need. They have been displaced and 375,000 children are requiring psychosocial support. As you can see the destructions in the picture, the targeting is very purposeful. And as you can see, our staff is on the ground. This is Gaza area in Gaza. Those who describe it, they say there is not a single home that stands in Gaza. It's an entire, if you will, an entire suburb or an entire neighborhood. Not a single uh, uh, home that is standing. There's 12 ambulances that were destroyed during this. And when we talk about 12 ambulances, probably this is over or maybe around 50% of the ambulances available. Remember, Gaza is a very small piece of land, very small. Someone tried to superimpose Gaza on Chicago. It was, it was basically smaller than the small suburbs in, in the city of Chicago. 13 hospitals, and I believe that's out of 15, 13 hospitals were damaged. Talk about precision and talk about military actions only. It is purposeful. It is to basically make sure that people are terrorized so they can leave their homes. 9,000 homes destroyed. 160 mosques destroyed. Among them, 44 were leveled to the ground. A degree of destruction that is incredible and unheard of before. The water situation in Gaza is extremely poor. People do not have clean water to drink. If anyone gets enough water for a day, then they are the luckiest people around. 188 schools were destroyed. Of those 188 schools, you have 18 schools that are honorable schools. They are United Nations schools that became housing for those people who had to flee their homes from Gaza from uh, Shijaiya, from, from uh, other neighborhoods that were heavily bombarded in, in Beit Hanun and Khan Yunus. And three of those schools received direct hits by Israeli military. Direct hits on women and children, population that already had escaped the homes that were destroyed already. Three of those schools, 188. Six universities, universities were partially destroyed. Now, I can tell you that we are on the phone with people on the ground. And I remember as the first time Chicago came out in support of Gaza about three weeks ago, about 10 days into the, into the, into the uh, I want to call it war, into the war crime. 10 days into the war crime, the people of Chicago came out. And I was very surprised to my friends in Gaza telling me how proud they are and how they feel supported, they don't feel abandoned. When we started our uh, meal distributions in the areas where people left their homes and went to the schools, in the schools, uh, people were telling us that it's not, it's not what we are sending. It's, you know, the CAF Foundation was able to provide 5,000 5, meals during Ramadan, iftars and, uh, iftars and uh, uh, suhoors for people. They were telling us it's not the food, it's not what you are sending. It is the fact that we recognize the people around the world, across the world, in a place where we hear the politicians, every single last one of them, lining up basically to be with the aggressor against the population that's being bombarded. There are people who care. There are people who are thinking of us, who are worrying about us, who are able to bring us food and supplies. That's what matters to them. What matters to them, they feel that they are not abandoned. And that is the most difficult thing for people when they are in a situation like this, where they feel helpless. Not only the most uh, superior power in the world, but also Arab regimes all around them, more and more putting siege on them to make them basically either flee their homes or completely surrender. And they do not, and they cannot surrender. To see that free people everywhere are helping them, even if it is literal, it makes a difference for them. And it's not what you give, it is literally the meaning of what, what you are giving. And so the CAP Foundation has made sure we provided 5,000 meals uh, during Ramadan. We uh, 
worked on three areas actually with the help of ANERA, one of, of, of organizations that have been providing support in the in the Gaza Strip for many, many years. We provided through the medicine because that was something that was extremely needed. We, we provided antibiotics uh, in particular and other medications that they requested. Uh, we, through UNRWA, the United Nations Agency, we provided non-food items, mattresses, diapers, uh, uh, things that are needed, uh, you know, sanitary napkins, etc. Things that are needed, and, and people many times were fleeing their homes literally with, with the clothes on their bodies. So they reached those schools and they have absolutely nothing to uh, uh, to use, including no mattresses, of course. So we provided that through an era, and then we have a local partner called United, uh, we called the Unlimited Friends uh, organization, and we provided through them the food and the water in particular. We continue to do that. Uh, we are aware only of two more organizations, relief organizations that are, you know, uh, basically unaffiliated with governments and others that are working on the ground from the United States. There are others from other countries, but from the United States we're aware only of two other organizations that are working directly with people on the ground to help them. And we are proud of that. But we are at the same time humbled that we are given the opportunity by the people of Gaza to, to help them, to show them that we are with them. Because truly, as, as a world today, the whole world, it's, it's conscious. The measure of how civilized we are as, as a world is measured by what's happening in Gaza. And we cannot walk away. If the, if the rich and powerful, if the governments of this world have decided to take the expedient route, have decided that they are not matched to money and power, we the people need to say differently and act differently. And the Zakat Foundation in very small ways is trying to do that. We are currently we decided to take on one school now that, that you know that some of those people they have they are in in, in uh, in the schools for a while uh, because their homes have to be rebuilt. Although you look at some pictures and you are at awe of people literally not even having a tent. I saw in some homes where they go and we have like the four walls of the room and three walls are on the ground and they literally take a blanket and they hang it and they are still living under it in a, in a destro totally destroyed home. Some people to that degree, they're not willing to leave their homes. And so we wanted to be able to sponsor one school, and if we are able to, we will do the second and the third, as many as we can, to support these people as they try to rebuild, rebuild their lives, first still cope with what's happening, because by the way, as we are speaking today, the war is not over, and that every day, as was mentioned earlier, they are saying it's down to 10 people being killed every day, but the war continues, and the bombing, the unabated bombing, the, the, the naked aggression on homes, on hospitals, on mosques continue, and so we need to continue to support the people of Gaza. We have developed a small program where we have a, a kit of essentials that would cost $150 for each family, and we decided systematically to sponsor them one school at a time, starting with one school, 1,000 uh, 1, 1, uh, uh, people, and we will continue to do it for as much as people support us and help us and it is reaching Gaza directly, it is not, we're not giving it to a second and a third party, it's not going 67% of it in a business cost, rather that it is direct. The world one day will look back and be ashamed of what has happened today in Gaza and what is being allowed to, to happen in Gaza. As they do today when they look back on slavery, as they look today and they look back on apartheid, as they, they look today and they look back on the plight of American Indians one day. The world will regret its stand as a whole, its stand on Gaza. I want us, each and every one of us, to be among those and our children and grandchildren, among those who can say to themselves and they tell their children and grandchildren that we didn't stand by and do nothing. We did what we were able to do, what was in our power to do, to help the people of Gaza stand up for their rights and stay in their homes in the face of the most aggressive, the most barbaric attack, criminal attack on them that is history have ever seen. I hope and pray that each one of you will have the heart and will have the ability and the means to help us 
in this noble mission so the people of Gaza are able to send a message to the world that you can have all the might and the power in the world, but it will never overcome the power of a people who want to live free. Thank you very much. I know you guys have been seeing a lot of statistics. We've talked about a lot of administrations and exactly what I for that point. Actually, I really appreciate your effort in this whole thing. Gaza is not about numbers. Gaza is about people, normal people. They have normal life, they have hopes, dreams, like every and each one of us. When, when I watch, I'm like, I'm pretty sure all of you guys watch the news. Just try to imagine those view, you know, like images that you see, if it was your child. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult to imagine even that. Because I, I, I try every time not to, to look at it in that perspective, but I just find myself looking at those children and I see the face of my child in them. It's, I don't have to describe for you that, that the feeling because I know all of you guys know what that means. So if we feel that way about it, we should do something. We should start somewhere and be productive Trying to do something is a big deal. Building the momentum is a big deal. Helping life, helping other organizations to build something makes a difference. It may, and it might, save my child and your child and their children. Because their children are our children. And if we do something about it, we are saving our children. We have actually a guest here, and I'm, I'm for the non-Arab population that they don't speak Arabic, it's going to be a little bit of an interesting concept because he doesn't speak English, but he's a very prominent and a well-known speaker and uh, imam. Uh, he's the president of the Islamic University of Minnesota. He's a very well prominent imam and he leads uh, the Isra Mosque in, 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 in Fridley, in Fridley area. Uh, I'm going to say that in Arabic when I introduce him. We will try to translate briefly some of what he says. We have a sister here. Thank you for volunteering to do this. So she's going to try to translate and, and do briefly his wordings. For those guys who know him, you know how he's, he's a very well-known and prominent. And, and we thank him also for being part of this and want to participate. I can't Arabic. من بنحب نرحب هوني في أخونا وأبونا الدكتور إمام فاروق السامي الرائي هو رئيس الجامعة الإسلامية في مينيسولا وإمام ومدير مسجد الإسراء. Please welcome him. والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه أما بعد إخوتي في الله في مدخل الحديث عن أهلنا في غزة أتذكر قولة الإمام أبي حنيفة رحمه الله لما بعث إليه الإمام مالك وكان في المدينة المنورة طلب الإمام مالك من الإمام أبي حنيفة أن يذهب إلى المدينة المنورة قال الناس في حاجتك لما تجلس في بغداد فبعث الإمام أبو حنيفة للإمام مالك قال له أجلس في بغداد وقلبي معلق في المدينة 
أفضل لي من أن أجلس في المدينة وقلبي معلق بالبغداد ربطا بذلك نقول يا إخوان وأنا من العراق أقول أبقى مع إخواني في غزة بمشاعري وأحاسيسي ومشاعري مع بغداد مع أهلنا في العراق لكن أبقى مع إخواني ومشاعري في غزة أهون علي من أن أبقى بمشاعري مع أهلي في العراق وقلبي معلق بغزة أقولها إخوان وثقوا بالله العظيم أشعر في هذا المقام أنني أتقرب إلى الله بحب لأهل غزة أنني أتقرب إلى الله بمشاعري نحو أهلي في غزة بل أنني أحس بارتقاء في الدرجات لما أرتقي بتعاطفي مع أهلي في غزة لأن قضية غزة ليست قضية فلسطين ولا قضية المسلمين ولا العرب ولا شيء من ذلك القضية قضية إيمانية ومن هنا لا أريد أن أدخل إلى هذا الموضوع من عدسة الإعلام وإنما أريد أن أدخل من عدسة القرآن الكريم الذي ألقى الضوء على الأحداث وكأن التاريخ يتكرر والأحداث تتكرر وقاسمها المشترك هو الصراع بين الإيمان والكفر البعض يقول لا نريد أن نجعل كل شيء في إطار النظرة الدينية إخواني ليس لنا والأحداث تشهد وثقوا بالله والنواميس تتكرر أن النواميس التي رسمت في القرآن الكريم لا يمكن أن تتغير حتى وإن تغيرت السياسات فالله عليم بالأمم عليم بالقلوب عليم بالأحداث والناموس الإلهي يتكرر في كل زمان وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد وثقوا بالله حيثما حيثما نبض الإيمان في أرض في هذا العالم سيتحرك نحوه العداء وستتكالب عليه الأمم إخواني لا أريد أن أدخل إلى الموضوع بمنظار سياسي ولا أريد أن أذكر الموضوع بمعاناة جماعات أو سياسات لا هنا لا بد من نظرة إنسانية نرتفع بها مع الجميع لننظر إلى الإنسان كونه مكرم من عند الله تبارك وتعالى ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن فضلنا تفضيلا هذه نظرة إنسانية إخواني هذه نظرة لا تحتاج إلى أن نقاسم الاتهامات أو نتقاسم المساجلات في إطار السياسة بل نحتاج يا أخوان إلى قلب إنساني حتى لا أقول إيماني حتى لا نفصل بين أجناس البشر وإنما إلى قلب إنساني يتعاطف مع كرامة الإنسان يتعاطف مع إنسانية الإنسان والله لا يوجد على وجه الأرض أحد لا يقف مع أهل غزة وأحس أنه يملك من الإنسانية ما يجعله في المقام الذي يشترك فيه مع هذا العالم بغض النظر عن الأديان بغض النظر عن الجماعات بغض النظر عن الاتجاهات إلا أن نجد أن من أعطاه الله في قلبه حبا لكرامة الإنسان إلا أن يكون معاهدنا في غزة إخواني النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام حدث حديثا وهذا الحديث من الأحاديث الغريبة والحديث يدل على نظرة الإنسان الإنسانية نظرة الإسلام الإنسانية النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام يحدث عن امرأة باغية من بني إسرائيل وشوف لما أقول من بني إسرائيل حط عليها خط عن امرأة باغية يعني عفوا باغية يعني عاهرة من بني إسرائيل تمارس الزنا قال لما وفدت إلى الله يوم القيامة غفر لها وأدخلها الجنة ماذا فعلت؟ رأت كلبا عطشا يلهث وكاد أن يموت فسقته ماء فأنقذته في ذلك الموطن بالله عليك كلب يسقى سقية ماء 
من اجلها يغفر لامراه باغيه كم هي النظره الربانيه النظره الانسانيه لكرامه الوجود قبل ان نصنف الوجود بين جماد او حجر او حيوان او بشر ولا شك ان البشر ياتي في الركن الاول اخواني امراه تدخل الجنه بسبب سقيا كلب بالله عليكم يا اخوان وانا انظر الى العالم الاسلامي والعالم العربي والدول المحيطه بغزه كيف يرضى انسان قبل ان يكون من ذات الفئه التي ينتمي اليها كيف يرضى ان يموت اهل غزه بهذه الطريقه الشنيعه بهذه الطريقه القاسيه المؤلمه والله لو كانت عنده ذره من انسانيه الانسان والله ما رضي بذلك تصور اخواني النار لما توجه ابراهيم عليه السلام الى النار وارغم عليها نار حضرت بشهر كامل نار هيئت لفرد واحد يقول لا اله الا الله هذه النار لما اشتعلت واستعرت شوف سبحان الله طير يمر في السماء لا يوجد احد ينصر ابراهيم حتى الاب حتى الام كلهم اشتركوا في جمع العقب وكلهم اشتركوا في ايقاد النار لا يوجد احد مع ابراهيم عليه السلام الا الواحد انظروا الى المشهد طير يطير في عالي السماء يرى ابراهيم يرمى في النار وإذا بطير يذهب إلى ماء قريب من النار ويحمل في منقاره قطرات من الماء ويحلق في السماء ويلقيها على النار قال كما جاء في بعض الروايات الله يسأله أيها الطير لم تفعل ذلك ماذا تفعل بنار إبراهيم الطير قال يا رب وجدت عبدا من عبادك مظلوما فأريد أن أنصرح حتى لا أفد إليك يوم القيامة ثم تسألني لما وجدت عبدا مظلوما ولا تنصرح نتكلم على طير مشاعر طير أو مشاعر طير مشاعر حيوان بالله يا أخوان أنا أتعجب الآن كيف نجد في الأمة إعلام ونجد في الأمة اتجاهات ترمي اللوم على اهل فلسطين وعلى اهل غزه وانهم يستحقون ذلك وهم من المسلمين والله اقول لا اسلام فيه والله هذول من المنافقين ومن ادعياء الاسلام والله لو كان عنده ذره ايمان لحركت فيه المشاعر ولحركت فيه الاحاسيس اخوتي في الله تذكروا قصه اصحاب الاخدود النار ذات الوقود اذ هم عليها اقعد وهم على بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم الا ان يؤمنوا بالله العز وجل، هذه القضيه الاساسيه، والله ما هو قضيه ارض ولا قضيه كذا ولا قضيه كذا، ولهذا نقول يا اخوان اعز مكان على قلبي بعد بيت الله وبعد قبر النبي عليه الصلاه والسلام هي غزه. لان العلماء قالوا كلاما لا بد ان نقف عنده. سئلوا عن اكرم ارض بعد بيت الله. وبعد المسجد النبوي اكرم مكان على وجه الارض فقالوا المكان الذي يخرج منه الشهداء هذه قضيه اخوان لا بد ان نتنبه لها ويتخذ منكم شهداء وانا قلت ان الارض التي اراد الله ان يكرمها يسقيها بدم الشهداء الارض التي تبقى معلم في التاريخ التي تسقى بماء الشهداء نعم يقول النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام من أذل عنده مؤمن انتبهوا يا أخوان وهذا الحديث الصحيح قال من أذل عنده مؤمن أم أذل كم عدد أهل غزة انظر ماذا فعل بهم من أذل عنده مؤمن وهو يقدر على
But they were thankfully sent us, they sent us this actually today on our Facebook page. It was like a gift from them and in order to, to present the Lord's suffering. I think we have another video. So I'm, I'm not going to take much time, but just the last video and then actually we'll wrap this up. So, are you ready? وإذا سألت عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إلى دعان اللهم منزل الكتاب ومجري السحاب وهازم الأحزاب اهزم هؤلاء الظلمة المعتدين الظالمين وانصرنا عليهم يا رب العالمين اللهم فرج كرباتنا وكربات المسلمين اللهم اشف جرحاهم وارحم موتاهم My dear respected brothers and sisters When one reporter was trying to say about 2,000 people killed in Gaza 
the family members of those victims say, don't say they are dead. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying they are dead. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ They are alive. But we don't feel it. And one woman, when she was in the news, she said, our home was destroyed in Yafa 50 years ago or so, more than 50 years ago, 60 some years ago. And we were forced to move to Gaza. And we spent 50 years of our lives after we got married. We had children to grow our children and we built our house here in Gaza. And now they came to us and they attacked us here in Gaza. They killed our children and they destroyed our home in Gaza. But that's fine. That's fine. We will take the challenge. And we are going to bring more children and raise them. We're going to build another house. But this time it's not going to be in Gaza. It's going to be in Yafa. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So brothers and sisters, this is the spirit of the people of Gaza. So if someone says, people of Gaza, teaching us life is true. And if someone says, people of Gaza, change our way of thinking, change our life, it's true. And it means there is a good news. We are starting to learn the lesson. And the lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will not change the circumstances of any individual or any community until they change from what within. We cannot claim to change the whole world by speeches, but we are inshallah able to change our own life by changing what within our own selves. And the people of Gaza learned the lesson. So brothers and sisters, what we are seeing here, with all the sadness, with all the depression, we can see, and everybody, the whole world can see, that there is a hope. And that's what makes it different. It is different. And we are start learning the lesson, inshallah. For us, brothers and sisters, it's good to be emotion. It's fine to cry, to relieve our stress, but this is not what we need to do tonight. We need to show some action. We need to show that we have learned a lesson and we have improved our way of life. Those who are given their lives, their blood, I feel ashamed and embarrassed here to say, please, Brothers and sisters, donate a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. Why? In a hadith, as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, "Lazawal dunya ala Allahi ahwal min an yuktal rajul mu'min dulman." For the whole world, for the whole dunya, it's worthless to Allah subhanahu wa taala than a life of a mu'min who get killed unjustly. So whatever we give brothers and sisters, whatever actions, whatever lectures, whatever contribution we do for them, it's a very little to compare to their sacrifice. We heard from the presentation about the number of hospitals destroyed or partially destroyed, how many schools destroyed, how many clinics destroyed, how many houses destroyed? How many houses damaged? Even Masajid now being destroyed lately, thanks to Bashar al Assad and to Sisi, because they gave the green light and the Jews said, Why not? Why not? If their leaders 
their regimes, destroying their masajid. Why not for us not to destroy the blessing and masajid? So masajid and kanais churches are not saved. Not talking about people's life. We, inshallah, expect them to be alive, shuhada, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we, our concern should go for those who are still alive, the injured. <coughs> if we can sponsor a hospital, like Brother Safa said, take one at a time, one hospital, or take one school, try to sponsor that school, or try to sponsor that hospital, try to provide them with some saving lives, medicine, some food, and it's not that we are doing them a favor, believe me, they are doing us a favor, because they are giving us the opportunity to give a very little from what we are gaining. We live a very luxury life here in the United States. We are fortunate, but it's a duty. It's a duty on all of us, and we should share. We should have compassion, and we should share. So brothers and sisters, I know we've been given in the month of Ramadan, we gave a lot, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even gave us more. And Allah has been given us. We did not eat only in the month of Ramadan. We did not drive our cars only in the month of Ramadan. We did not enjoy the air conditioning and the luxury and the comfort in our houses, in our businesses, in our jobs, in our positions only in the month of Ramadan. We are enjoying it every day. And those people in Gaza, they deserve our share and care for every day. So even we gave in the month of Ramadan, one of the signs and the evidence that Allah subhanahu accepted our deeds is to follow Hassan with another Hassan. We did a lot of hasanat in Ramadan, subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it. We have to follow this hasanat with another hasanat. So, yes, we are in Shawwal and we are going to do it again, inshallah, because Rabbu Ramadan is Rabbu Shawwal. And we want to do it for, the, for, for the, our brothers and sisters in, in, in Gaza. So, I assume, inshallah, with this blessed gathering, we should come out, inshallah, with $100,000. I want to make a moderate number, I don't want to say a million. Because any school costs two, three million dollars. I'm, I'm familiar with that. I know that. I've been a member, founding member of some schools in, in Chicago. I know three to five million dollars cost the school. Three to five million dollars cost any mosque. So I don't want to tell you know three million dollars. Let's say one hundred thousand dollars to come up from this blessed gathering. We don't have to come up with the money right now. Let's give ten percent of our income. If we make $100,000 a year, and I know we have fortunate brothers and sisters in our community who are doctors, who are business people, they make $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, dollars maybe a million dollars a year. Let's give 10%. Let's commit to give 10% of our income for this year. We don't have to give it now, but make a pledge to give it for the entire year, for our brothers and sisters, for the children, we, for the sake of those children we saw. And we all have children, and we know how valued, how dear children to us. So can I have few brothers, inshallah, and sisters, just to raise the hand to pledge at $10,000. $10,000, inshallah. I need to see few hands, because we want to complete 100, inshallah. We will not leave this blessed gathering, inshallah, tonight until we reach our goal. We need $100,000 pledges. Not cash pledges. So the first hand, inshallah. Mashallah, he's, 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 inshallah, he's in the field. He said, we have the first one. So I'm going to go to the second one, inshallah. Second brother or sister, who's a doctor, a businessman, businesswoman. And whatever you give, we should have the belief that man naqasa, man or man sadaqa. And we should have that experience. Whatever we gave in the past, I'm sure you feel it. It came back to you. And it does not come back to you with the same number. Allah will multiply it one to ten, maybe to seven hundred times. We have the other ten, alhamdulillah. Takbir. Allahumma a'ti munfiban khalafa. Kulu ameen. Allahumma a'ti munfiban khalafa. 
Allahumma a'ti munfiqan khalafa The third hand brothers and sisters The third hand inshallah Tell any of those volunteers next to you And I need the third hand The third hand We need to come up with the big numbers Because that what makes you make us inshallah reach our goal fast A third hand inshallah We need sunnah is at least odd number So I'm not going to stop in two I need a third hand we should come, inshallah, up with the third hand. Otherwise, you know, I will call up my dear brother, Dr. Farouk. He helped me two years ago, and alhamdulillah, we did a good job. So, inshallah, tonight we're going to do the same thing, a good job, inshallah. So, you want Dr. Farouk to call your names? Because I'm from Chicago, I don't know, uh, I don't know you by names. I know you are my brothers and sisters. I feel I am... With my, with my family, extended family. So the third hand, inshallah, we have the third hand. Inshallah, inshallah. Jazakallah khayran. Jazakallah khayran. Bayyadallah wajhah. Jazakallah khayran. Allahumma a'ti munfiqan khalafa. Allahumma a'ti munfiqan khalafa. So even you can still think about the $10,000, but I'll go inshallah to $5,000 to, to make it easier. We have the first 5,000, I need 10, 10 brothers at least, 10 brothers and sisters, inshallah, with five. So 5,000, inshallah, second hand, inshallah. Bismillah, 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 whatever you give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give it to you back in multiplied numbers, not the same number. Imagine we fast a month for Ramadan, 30 days. Rasulullah if you, he said, if you fast six days in Shawwal, that makes it 36 days. 36 times 10, as if you fast the whole year. Subhanallah. We are dealing with Allah. And Allah is most generous. Do we have the second one? Second one, inshallah. Second one. Second one. To speak about generosity, brothers and sisters, as it was reported in Al-Hadith Al-Qudisi, that Allah subhanahu wa says, لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم جاءوا في سعيد واحد فسألوني كل سألني مسألته فأعطيت كل واحد مسألته ما نقص مما عندي إلا كما ينقص المخيط إذا أدخل البحر See how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous? If he give everyone his needs or her needs, ins and jinn, human being and jinn, the first from Adam to the last. If they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah to give them all their needs, it will decrease.